Thank you, Linda. It's very kind of you. And obviously, success has many parents. Failure is an orphan. You are definitely one of the proud parents of AB32's success and all of the work since, because anybody can come up with an idea. Anyone can come up with a plan. But as you all know, it's a lot harder to implement those things, especially when they're ambitious and audacious. So give a great big hand to former secretary of the California EPA, Linda Adams. And, uh, and of course, everything is politics, as we saw just now in David's presentation, and we certainly know from our walks of life. So where is Fran Pavley, who's the actual author of AB32? Where is she? I can't see through the lights. Where are you, Fran? Stand up and take a bow. Great big round of applause for Fran. Truly one of the most effective legislators in the entire country, over and over again, you know, even before Linda and I got to Cal EPA and into the Schwarzenegger administration. Fran was the one, as many of you know, who passed AB 1493 that, uh, that was the tailpipe emission standards. And that's one of the reasons our cars got cleaner, more efficient to this day, saved us money, and is helping to save the planet. So thank you. And, and one more round of applause uh, for David Horsey. What an amazing talent. No way I can be that succinct, but I'll try to stay on time. Um, this video you just saw asks a very simple question. What do you believe? Now, you've probably been answering that question in your mind as you sat there watching this. So let me add one more question for your mental consideration. What will you do about what you believe? And before you answer, I'm going to paraphrase Greta Thunberg, who's been in the news a lot lately. She's the 16-year-old Danish student who is leading the global student strikes on climate change movement. I'm going to paraphrase her in saying that whatever you're prepared to do about climate change and these sustainability issues that we just saw in the video, it's not enough. And we're acting all of us are acting as if there's still more time. There isn't. She says that the house is on fire, so it's time to panic. We need to wake up those who don't know this uh, or don't care. Honestly, those of us who do care need to do more. Or put another way, think globally, act locally, panic personally. Now, Late last year, the IPCC told us that the outlook for our future is much worse than originally predicted. And that's pretty damn bad, considering that they warned us two decades ago that climate change could destroy the planet. Now, I don't mind telling you that with over four decades of environmental awareness and activism myself, it's hard to be an optimist. When I was 12 years old, I took my first scuba dive off the coast of Southern California. I wanted to be Mike Nelson of Sea Hunt, for those of you that are old enough to remember that black and white TV series. I see a few older gray heads nodding along with mine. Um, and when I dove beneath the waves off Palos Verdes, not far from here, I was truly awestruck by the majestic kelp beds, the abundant sea life, my first rubbery taste of abalone cooked by my mother, who was never a good cook, so I blamed her, but actually it's just rubbery. Um, and then a decade later, I was horrified to return to that magical underwater California seascape and found that it was completely devoid of life. A moonscape of barren rock and silt, polluted urban runoff and sewage dumping had destroyed the entire ecosystem in just a few years. And that sure got my attention. Now, on the other hand, a few years later, I met a Hopi Indian elder named Vernon Masayasva, who many of you might know. He showed me a civilization, the Hopi people, that had continuously occupied the same land for over 10,000 years, living sustainably in one of the most unforgiving, stingy landscapes on Earth. Now, there's many reasons for the remarkable success of the Hopi over such a long t period of time, but one stood out to me of what he said. He said that when the Hopi people sit down to eat, they say, kwa kwa itam nunusa, which means, thank you, we have eaten. They don't just mean the people at the table at that moment. They mean the cook of the food had to eat, the farmer had to eat, the plants that they're eating right now, that all had to be nourished by the wind and the sun and the rain 
and the nourishment of the soil. Otherwise, none of that food would be on the table. So they say, thank you, we have eaten, because they want to never forget that everything is connected, including humans to the planet that sustains us. Now, if one society of humans can learn enough about these lessons about sustainability, why can't we all? Now, of course, there's far more examples of civilizations that did not learn the lesson in time. <clears throat> As I began my own career in environmental activism, I met Joanne Van Tilburg, the anthropologist who solved the mystery of what happened to the once robust civilization on Easter Island. In fact, you might have seen her just this past week on 60 Minutes. She uncovered evidence that the once robust population disappeared because they consumed or destroyed almost 100% of the natural resources of their once lush tropical paradise in a few generations of conspicuous consumption, leaving nothing behind but a barren island and the mute testament of gigantic stone effigies, the Moai. It's that path, if it seems way too familiar, it's because the way we're treating our Earth island today. So which direction are we really headed? Could we forge a sustainable path like the Hopi? Or are we doomed to the self-destructive fate of Easter Islanders? And that brings me back to the questions. I know what you believe about climate change and our future, or you wouldn't be here. But what will you do based on what you know and what you believe? Gandhi said, my life is my message. Let it be so with each of us. Of course, there's a hundred little things that most of us are already doing, I'm sure, like recycling, using LED light bulbs, driving more efficient cars or electric vehicles, even buying credits to offset our travel to conferences like this. But I worry about the short-term decisions we make today that are locking in a long-term scary future for our kids. So I'm gonna give you what I think are the three most important things that I think we must do or commit to today to keep things from being locked in to be far worse in the future. First, don't ever buy or lease another new gasoline or diesel powered car. Because whether you drive it or someone else does later, you're locking in 20 years of greenhouse gas and air pollution with the lifetime of that vehicle. So stop buying them. Next, give up beef. Do it today. Be serious. Don't go home and face your family and say you care about your kids, but you're not prepared to make that simple change in your own life. You know the disproportionate impact that meat in general, but beef in particular has on our planet, on water, on soil, on air, and certainly on our climate. Doing so will make big changes for the planet and will fundamentally change the food industry and our land use patterns for decades to come. When you eat that pound of beef this week, you're locking in more greenhouse gases for decades to come. Give it up. And finally, perhaps most of all, most important, vote in every election no excuses, and only for candidates that support meaningful climate action. As we saw in some of David's uh, cartoons, a lot of it isn't meaningful. So even if you have to cross party lines, as I did to go work for Republican Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger because I knew he took climate change seriously, even if you have to cross party lines to get to someone you can vote for that will take climate change seriously, you have to do it. Now, if you don't, We'll get more of the current approach that President Trump has laid out. Oh, you thought he didn't believe in climate change? Maybe because of those cartoons? You thought he didn't have a plan? No, he has a plan. You may not have heard it. He said the US can lower the temperature dramatically just by switching from Fahrenheit to Celsius. <laughs> he actually said that. Seriously. And I'm sorry to be the preacher and waving my finger at you because you're all here. The fact that you are here again is a testament to your dedication. I'm just asking you to ramp it up and do it faster because it's time for big commitments and action from each one of us in our personal and professional lives. It's also too late to just do that. We need to be, we need to, to get all of the climate firefighters engaged. We need to make everybody a climate firefighter. And then all of us go rescue those who are still asleep in the burning building. 
we've got to wake them up. We've got to get them to understand why they too should take at least those three simple steps that I mentioned. But let's start acting like the house is on fire, which also means I'm going to repeat something I've said to this conference the last time I spoke here and anywhere I give a talk, so this will sound familiar to some of you. Who among us will be the first to say that I can live with a little less, that my children will have a lot more? Who among us will be the first to say that my life will not only be measured by the number on the bottom of a balance sheet, but by the balance of clean air and clean water and healthy landscapes that I bequeath to my children? And who among us will be the first to heed that call to action that rang out across this land six decades ago when a sane, competent president of these United States challenged us to ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The fact that you are here means you're already on that journey, thank you. But the fact that there's so much more work to do means that if you make commitments for those three things I asked you to do and much more that I'm sure you're all smarter than I am and know what to do, if you make those commitments, then that's something that would answer President Kennedy's call to action more than enough. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me.